All righty. So today we're celebrating the soul of Christmas, and we're going to move with this soul of Christmas all throughout the season. And today we're focusing on hope and anticipation. How many of you over the years have heard on mostly on family trips, right? And it's mostly children. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? What? It's their desire to reach the destination, right? Well, in a way, we're like that in this Advent celebration as well. We, we become children again, and, and we every day have an opportunity, like the little boy at that beautiful video at the beginning, to say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And can we, uh, we can find uh, the Christmas spirit in waiting, and that's the true gift of this season. Waiting and into, anticipating as we set off on this journey for Christmas 2018. In the Gospel of Luke, we're witness to people who are waiting and anticipating. In fact, waiting and anticipating the birth of children. Zechariah and Elizabeth are awaiting the birth of John, and Mary is awaiting the birth of Jesus. Now, all three of these are some pretty unlikely parents. Zechariah and Elizabeth were thought to be way too old to bear a child, and Mary, of course, tradition tells us, was a virgin. Which leads to our first text today, which is a reminder to us in the Gospel of Luke, the first chapter. This is the month to read that Gospel. But on Luke 30, 137, it says, For nothing is impossible with God. And in a way, all three of these folks accept that. They accept that they are able to be bearers of God's grace and love because they do believe that nothing is impossible for God. Paul picks up on this hopeful anticipation message in Romans where he says, Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. So that's kind of his way of trying to encourage us to be hopeful in life and to be patient with the challenges that we face and to be constant in prayer. Then in Romans 15, 13, he says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Now remember last week I said scripture only means something if we're able to apply it to life. So take these three texts with you today and think about them in the week to come. Text centered on how with God all things are possible and on hope and having hope even in tribulation and always uh, having hope in prayer. So as we sit back, we're waiting for Christmas and ask again and again, I pray, for the next 24 days or 23 days, are we there yet? In his book, The Soul of Christmas, author Thomas More reminds us that the true power of the Christmas story is found far beyond religion. Christmas is a season where we're introduced to a baby who would grow to be a visionary leader, whose primary role in the world was to teach and to heal. A man who brought people together and made circles bigger, including everyone. No one was excluded. Jesus, who presents a vision of the world rooted in love, community, and friendship. Now, these are the central themes of Christmas. You know, I believe now more than ever this world needs to be reminded of the Christmas story. And they need to be reminded that the Christmas story is not dependent upon a religious tradition. In fact, Moore contends that the Christmas story is one that could be shared with people of many different faith traditions. It's about a man. It's a man and uh, Jesus. And he is this visionary leader, we're the ones. Religion is the one who has put, them in, put him in this box, this box that's exclusionary just for us. But the truth is, is that Jesus is someone who can continue to make all people feel welcome. All people, no matter what your faith tradition is, you are welcome in Jesus' presence. There are no rules. We created the rules I believe that unless we as the church start taking Jesus out of the church and start sharing in dialogue with people of different faith traditions, well, Christianity is going to have a pretty hard time in this 21st century if we can't find a way to do that. See, Jesus is to be celebrated all year round. 
What happens at Christmas time, though, is this is our festival season, our festival of the birth of Jesus, a time of celebration, of merrymaking, and of indulgence, a time of generous gift giving, inviting people into our homes and into our lives, a time to reconnect, to eat, drink, and be merry, and yes, to say and celebrate Christmas, to say Merry Christmas. This is a time of pilgrimage for us as Christians, pilgrimage and contemplation and sharing in a language that offers prayers and good greetings to all we encounter, no matter what their faith tradition. Now, with all of that said about this being a really holy, amazing time about Jesus' birth, I have to be absolutely honest with you. We don't know when Jesus was born. We don't know. But given that he is a child of the light that overcomes darkness, there's no better time than the winter sol solstice to celebrate Jesus, which is exactly what the religious traditions have done. And for those who came before us, long before the Christian church, well, they were pretty wise at putting a time of celebration of light right around now, the winter solstice. In fact, 4,500 years ago, the, the Druids found a way to celebrate the return of light to the world. In the county Meath in Ireland, I've been there, there's this place called Newgrange. And it's an amazing place, and like I said, it was built as a temple around 4,500 years ago, we believe. It's an amazing place that when you enter, you have to crawl through darkness and stone passages until you reach the center. And then when you reach the center, you can stand up straight. And yes, on December 21st, this is what you see, and that's the only time you see it. The light comes back into the temple, and the people, the, the Druids, were reminded that indeed darkness is going to be overcome by the light of a new season, and they got pretty excited about that. They built this whole temple, created a whole place where they had to walk into and struggle to get into, and then they waited for the light. Hmm, sounds like a pretty great story to follow, doesn't it? I love the intricate design of this place, and it is pretty profound. Now, the 21st isn't the only day that you get light in there, but it's the only day you get light like this. Now, that tradition isn't alone either. In the Buddhist tradition, and Andrew and I went to Thailand this past year, we were able to go to a wat and meet a, a uh, abbot, but we were also able to enter a stupa, and this is the stupa. The stupa is the place where all the relics, it's kind of a temple, it's kind of a place of meditation and contemplation, and it's where all the relics are kept. If you go throughout Thailand, they'll say things like, Buddha's tooth is here, or whatever. But, uh, but so they each, each uh, stupa has a relic, and you climb into it as kind of a tradition climbing in. And what I loved about this stupa in particular was the way that you got out of it was you had to crawl down and go through a very tiny passage and then stand up again. And it was supposed to remind us that we're born again. Once we pray and share in a time of meditation and contemplation, you can be born again. So you physically have to bow down in order to get out of this particular stupa. Hmm. It's interesting to me that we have found a way to incorporate some different things that sound just a little similar to these stories, haven't we? I mean, we have stars that represent light. We have manger, a place to go for contemplation. We have a virgin mother. We have a cross, and we are mindful of a journey. A journey through darkness to light, to realize that there are times when there, are no, there is no room for us, and we do not feel a sense of welcome. And then we, like those who have come before us, can be transformed and made new and be reborn by the light. If you go to the place where it is said that Jesus was born, do you know you have to do the same thing that you do in the stupa and that you do at the temple at Newgrange? You have to bow down in order to get into that place. You have to bow down and go under this odd little uh, place in order to get into the place where Jesus was born. See, I think the story is universal, that all of us need to find a way to step through the darkness to really find and experience the light. We all must be willing to get on our knees. 
And the only place that we can do that is the place where we recognize that the one that we follow was born in a place that really nobody else wanted to be. We have to get down on our knees and bow before one who was not welcome in the world, and we connect in that profound way. And we not only connect in that profound way, but we follow a light, and a light that leads us through the darkness to the love of God. Not only do we take this journey for ourselves, but we encourage others to share in it with us. Now, it's not an attempt, I believe, to change them, but it's an effort, effort to share our personal transformation with others that we can get through the Christian faith. For example, all of this political stuff about saying Merry Christmas for me isn't political at all. When I say Merry Christmas, I mean I want you to have a beautiful, merry season. One of, yes, indulgence, one of celebration, one of decoration. I want to say Merry Christmas because that's how I'm transformed. Now, I want a Buddhist to say whatever a Buddhist says, and I want, I want people, the, the Muslims, to say whatever it is they say, and I want to joyfully say Merry Christmas. Why? Because I want us to be merry. It's not about good behavior, but being merry is about seeing beauty and goodness in life in spite of the bad stuff that's around us. Merry Christmas. Go ahead, try it. Merry Christmas. Have you been saying it, or has all the controversy gotten to you? Merry Christmas. It's merriment. It's a time of celebration. Merry Christmas. Moore suggests that that's a really good one, but if we wanted to be more uh, honest about really what we're saying to one another, is he said we would follow the Japanese, our Japanese brothers and sisters, who say, wabi-sabi. Wabi-sabi. Have a wabi-sabi Christmas, which means find the beauty and goodness in life, even though there is imperfection. And even though sometimes we, there are things in this life that are fading, there is something profound to celebrate. So perhaps if you're not willing to say Merry Christmas, this is the year you say Wabi Sabi Christmas! Give it a try. Hey, your gardeners, that might just work. See, the point is, is not that ch life is perfect, but our tradition is that in fact, even in the midst of darkness, there's some light to celebrate. Have a wabi-sabi Christmas. Have a merry Christmas as it unfolds in each moment, as you wait in traffic, as you decorate your house, as you gather with your families, as you are forced to go to company parties, as you are forced to do different things you don't want to do. Find the merriment in the midst of the darkness. As you are buying your gifts this year, consider... Um, doing it in a manner that brings merriment or wabasabi to you. Traditionally, we have given gifts as a sign of God's gift to us in Jesus, right? As a sign of the gift of light to us yet once again. Today, gifting has become something very different, hasn't it? Just like we talked about last week, gifting is kind of turning into, just like Thanksgiving, kind of turning into this obligation. Oh, no, you didn't get me something. Or you didn't get me something, did you? And then you quickly move to Amazon and try to find something to give somebody. That's not what it's all about, my friend. Gift giving is a time to be mindful of all the gifts we're given, the merriment in the darkness, and a time to truly celebrate a gift to someone else. A friend of mine started yesterday, and I think it's profound and beautiful. She and her husband are musicians, and they are celebrating Advent this year by sharing a special song and message every day, and they're doing it on Facebook, but they're dedicating it to a member of their family. They're sharing a story about the family member, and they're sharing a beautiful song with the family member, and that's their gifts to one another this Christmas. And there have only been two, but let me tell you, they're both so beautiful that their gifts that I'm recognizing are being given to someone else. If you could participate in this kind of gift giving this year, what kind of gift giving that would have a lasting impact, what would you do? I think you could sit down and write a letter I think you could share a story like we saw in StoryCorp there, and I think that will have so much more meaning than a brown box coming from Amazon. I would encourage you not only to do that, but to share gifts that incorporate your spiritual gifts as well. 
I have shared with you before that in our house, we have the gift of hospitality, and people say, you're ministers. It's crazy to open your house in December. No, it's what we do, and we are blessed to be able to do it. Perhaps you have the gift of hospitality, and you can take someone for lunch and just tell them just how much you love them. Or you can let the new baby in your family know how exciting it is to be a part of your family and crazy and sometimes difficult, but, you know, somehow create gifts that have a lasting impression. Yesterday, I put a a card for my grandmother on the tree from the year that I was born, and this 33-year-old card is just gorgeous. I've put it on my tree every year for 53 years. And it's really, it's a profound gift. My grandma's been gone since I was 18 years old, but it keeps giving. Friends, this is the year to consider that kind of gift giving. What friend needs a little love and light coming through the darkness, and how can you bring merriment into this world? Now, I mentioned that tradition of, are we there yet? Are we there yet? You know, a friend told me, that you really don't hear that as much anymore in the car. Because kids are keeping busy, and I'm I'm not complaining about new traditions, because I think it's amazing that I have the ability to be face-to-face with grandchildren 5,000 miles away. But we're missing something, aren't we? We're missing something. And how is it that we people of faith, with a faith tradition, can make our traditions in such a way that are welcoming to others and welcoming to kids who are finding connections and not being mindful of not being there yet and what a joy that is. I think the best way that we can do that is become kids ourselves. I think if kids were able to see us get excited again about Christmas in really crazy ways, that would be such a gift to them. If you could send them a story on their tablet or something to let them know this is a magical season and yes, it has elves and yes, it has a baby and yes, it has shepherds and yes, it has light and share that. I believe then Christianity still can have an impact in the world in profound ways. We can take this message forth and bring the spirit of merriment, of wabasabi, of gift-giving, of celebration, of putting Christmas decorations up and preparing for the season, we could take it to the next level in this 21st century. And we can do it so in a way that Jesus would say, Merry Christmas. Do you know studies show that people who share in merriment throughout the holiday tend to have a little better attitude going into the new year, even though most of us have six more pounds. Studies also show that decorating your house is good for you. Decorating your house is good for you.